of today's uh, what we're going to be looking at today is a lot of the questions you asked last class. How do you calculate the model? There were a lot of questions last class about outliers. So by the end of today's class, you'll, you'll really be able to understand what outliers do to the model. And then this other question of how many components should you fit? Uh, and you'll see that there's actually that's not a question we can answer directly. There's no yes or no answer there, or very clear cut answer with that, that one. But we'll, we'll talk about methods that help you judge how many components should be um, added to a model. So that's where we're going to today. I do want to just quickly go through this picture that was off on the website. Last class, I kind of screwed up the explanation on what x hat means. Okay, so x hat for uh, for our uh, for a particular row. So just to recap, then we've got this matrix X, and if we take the i row from that, that's our raw data that we measure. We fit a, a PCA model, and let's just do <coughs> one component for now: T1 and P1 transpose. T1 P1 transpose can be used to calculate a prediction for that row which we call xi hat. And xi hat, we showed last class through that mathematical derivation, is equal to the corresponding score value in this position, which I'll call ti, comma 1, indicating it's the ith score it down the row for the first uh, component. So ti1, p1 transpose, gave us our prediction of x hat. Now geometrically, and this is the part that I messed up, what that means is x hat is just a vector in the direction of the first loading, p1. So p1 is a unit vector in the same direction, and then we scale that vector shorter or longer, depending on k speed, times this t value. And remember, t value, the t value for the i row is nothing more than the distance from the origin to the projection of the data point. This is the actual data point here in the solid blue circle. Let's project that data point onto the vector. If we go back to this three-dimensional plot, it's the same figure, just I've oriented the axes differently. Here's our origin. There's my data point, my first component. T1 is nothing but the distance of that point projected perpendicularly onto T1 from the origin. So that's the calculation for x hat i. And we'll add the subscript here, x hat i comma 1, to indicate that that's the prediction of x using only one component. Okay. Now we go and add a second component to the model. Second component, we showed last, or told, I told you last class, we, we forced that second component to the first one. Project that point perpendicularly onto P2, okay? And then find the point along P2 now where that point lies, that's x hat i comma 2. So it's going to be calculated exactly the same way, x hat i, using the second component now is equal to ti from the second vector times P2 transpose, okay? So we've got two vectors now, x hat uh, x hat i comma 1 for the first component's prediction, and then the part for the second component, x hat 2. Those two vectors can be added using the usual vector summation, where I say x i hat is equal to the first part plus the second part. And using the vector summation, that prediction is this second vector shown here in black. And that's a vector that lies on the plane. So coming back to the previous picture over here, these two, two components, P1 and P2, form a plane. They jointly define a plane in this three-dimensional space. So this is a two-dimensional space within a three-dimensional space. Okay? And this open point represents the projection perpendicular of the raw data value onto that plane. And that's the same blue circle with the open, the open blue circle over there. So what we're really showing is that that point is the, is the summation of two vectors. And furthermore, if we look at another, another vector summation, now we're looking in this direction over here. There's this vector x 
the raw vector that we had can be broken down into two other vectors, x hat plus the residual. Okay, so a lot of vector summations going on in here, in this diagram. That's why I really wanted to <coughs> illustrate it properly. It took me a while to draw this figure out. I hope it makes more sense this time. This is what I was trying to convey last class. So the key is that we break our raw data x into two, into two vectors. We decompose x into two other vectors. One, a vector that lies on the plane, so xi hat, plus a residual vector, e. <coughs> okay, so we decompose this raw data point into two other vectors. And these two vectors are in two different spaces. One is on the plane, and the other vector is perpendicular to the plane. That's very key in PCA. The, the, the plane is orthogonal to the residuals. Okay. And the other thing I want you to think about, this is a little harder for me to illustrate, but let me talk through it with you. Take a look at the picture. Imagine we have one component, P1. We don't have a second component yet. Okay. What does the residual vector look like, the vector E, look like if we only have one component? Where does it travel? like this and, and lands a perpendicular here, okay? So it's hard for me to illustrate on this diagram here, but it's basically a vector that looks like that. This vector over here that comes kind of from this point, travels off the plane and lands up at that tip over there, that vector is the residual vector after fitting one component. It's very clear that that vector is a much longer vector than this vector over here. <coughs> This is the vector E after using two components. This vector that comes from here to here is the vector after using one component. And that is what PCA does. By adding a new component, all the vectors, all the residuals become smaller. Okay, they can never get bigger. That's what PCA is doing. It's trying to best fit the data. So every component that is added must explain something about the data, and so that means the residuals must get smaller. The residuals can never get bigger after adding more and more components. Okay? So the first ve residual vector is this distance over here. The second residual vector is, is a much smaller distance. Okay? And if I added a third component, I would explain all my variance and uh, would, all the residuals would be zero. Because I'm fitting a three-dimensional space inside a three-dimensional space, so there's no error left over. So that's what I wanted to recap uh, from last class. And some of these concepts will be used again in today's class. In particular, if I write this for every row in the original matrix, I get the equation that we'll see today. <coughs> you saw it last week. x is equal to x hat plus an error. Okay? So here it's written for one row. If I write it for all my rows, I collect my rows together, and I can write the matrix form. The other key equation that you need to recall from last class is that x hat is equal to tp transpose. And that just comes from collecting these equations together. Okay? So tp transpose just tells us how we calculate our vectors on the plane. And so then I can expand this equation to write x is equal to tp transpose. So this is the, the key equation in PCA that defines PCA. The relationship between the X space and the scores, T. And they're linked together by this low matrix. Today's class is going to be mathematical. We're going to draw on things that you probably learned from the first year and second year mathematics. Eigenvalue, singular value decomposition. We're going to look at least squares. There's going to be a lot of math in today's class, and it may be frustrating by the end of today. Um, it's not something I expect you to understand everything by the end of today's class. I will tell you the honest truth. I only, every time, like I've been looking at PCA and so on for about 10 years now. Every year or every time I come back to the paper, there's something new that I see 
I see, okay, I see, I read a paper that talks about PCA from a singular value decomposition point of view and then teaches me something about PCA I never knew before. So we're going to look at several methods in today's class, but you, you should go back and look back at the videos, look back at the notes a few days later, and uh, maybe you need to go review your first year and second year math notes to understand what today's class is more about. Um, so I encourage you to do whatever is necessary to make sure you understand today's class. Today's class is, for me, one of the most important classes in the entire course. Okay, let's quickly recap the assignments and then we'll move on to that. Sorry? Uh, if I close off, then the board is not visible. Yeah, it's very tricky, sorry. <laughs> Uh, okay, so we have these five variables that you looked at on this data set, and they were described online, so I'm not going to go through that again. Set is this, uh, does this agree with what you all got in the software? Okay, so you can compare again your assignment. I didn't really mind, or I don't really mind in general for this course, which software package you use. If you want to use the course software, if you want to use MATLAB, or any other tool, please feel free uh, to, if you want to code up PCA and after today's class, you'll, you'll know how to do it. It'll be very easy to do it after today's class. In the future, please feel free to use whatever tools you want to answer these questions. So if you calculated this in MATLAB or in Excel even, no problem. I did this in R. So centric vector, scaling vector, those values should agree with what you see in the software as well. This was a slide from last class to show what, what centering and scaling does. So I'm going to again. If there's any questions on it, feel free to uh, interrupt me. Now, what I wanted to emphasize is what centering and scaling does. We looked at last class. This is the raw data. So the values for oil go between 14 and 20. And we just go back here. So the centering vector, you see the centering value for oil is 17. So that falls roughly between 14 and 20, that makes sense. The standard deviation for my scaling vector, 1.6. If I go back here, I see these numbers. The, the mean is at 17 plus 1.6 minus 1.6. That kind of covers the range of, of plus or minus 2 sigma. All those variables are pretty much normally distributed and so when we scale afterwards, this is now the scale bit. Did you notice the board changed? Yeah. <laughs> All that changed on that illustration was these distances over here. They've, they've, the ranges have changed. And you notice they're all plus or minus two, give or take a bit. So after centering and scaling, I've moved my data to a new location. But notice as I flick between these two screens, I'm just alternating here between raw data and center and scale absolutely nothing changes. So centering and scaling does not modify the structure of the data. That's the key thing. So when I deal with companies who want to give me confidential data, but they don't want to sign confidentiality agreements, I say center and scale the data and give it to me. I can work with it, center and scale. But I don't know anything about your proprietary measurements yet. I have no idea if you call this variable A, B, C, D, and E, and you center and scale your data and give it to me, I don't know. I can't figure out your trade secrets from it, but I can do PCA and I can work with it afterwards as if it was the raw data. Okay, so centering and scaling, key issue does nothing to change the relationships in the data set. Okay. Variance explained, first component, everyone agree with that number? 60%. First component, second component explains an additional 26% taking up to 86. So uh, in the software, I just got the screens up here. Uh, so here's the R squared, 60%. Second component, cumulative A is 80%. In the, so if you right click on any of these plots, you can see the raw numbers. So go create table and then we can get the individual R squared values over there. That's great. Um, next question asked is P1. So draw the P1 vector. And here it is as a bar plot. 
Did everyone get a positive value for oil, negative value for density? Anyone got them the signs flipped the other way around? No? Okay. We'll talk about that at the end of today's class. Some, that can sometimes happen, but um, I guess the software has been programmed to, to always force the direction in a certain way. So oil should be roughly 0.45, density minus 0.45, something, etc. Crispine fracture. Everything is large except hardness. Okay. So what would be the characteristics of a large T1 pastry gun? Uh, a large T1 uh, pocket, right? Yeah. So you will have a large positive value in oil and density. Oh, oh crispy. Yeah. yeah. And also you want a large value in hardness. And you want a large negative value in density uh, and <coughs> Okay, so what would be the, how would you describe a pastry that had those properties? Like how would you feel, like, or name a pastry from the grocery store that you could buy that would be kind of like that? Donuts? Oily, or deep fried donuts. Oily, crispy. Deep fried donut. <laughs> I was thinking of, yeah, croissant. <laughs> oh, croissant was what I had in mind when I thought of a high tea one. Very oily, not very dense. Sometimes it can be uh, a little bit crispy. Fracture, you can bend it through a whole lot of angle before it breaks. Um, and hardness is really not an effect in, in the tea one. So it's a soggy, oily pastry, not, uh, not the best. Negative T1 back there. It would be, uh, be very dense and have very fractures. So it might be like, like, an or like a cookie or something that's yeah. maybe not very oily. A crispy cookie, um, even something along the line of uh, like snack food or food, that, uh, that hard Swedish bread that you can buy from <coughs> or something like that could be something that really you can't bend it by a whole lot before it fractures. Okay, so it's got a very low angle of fracture, not very dense, not low oily level, uh, etc. Okay, so, uh, so you could you could you could imagine what the characteristics would be of those sorts of pastries by seeing the combinations. And that's what I wanted you to think through, is when we move around the score plot, as we go from right to left or left to right, there's a progression in how that pastry's texture properties are changing. Okay. So if someone asked you, I want a pastry with a certain characteristics of oiliness, density, crispiness, and fracture, you could go probably locate with reasonable accuracy on that plot where that pastry would, would expect to lie. Okay? And since this company has produced 50 pastries in the past with these characteristics, you could go find the closest one that could be a match for that if you, if you were looking <coughs> to develop, say, say someone came to you and says, I want you to make a new pastry for me that you've never made before. They give you the characteristics of it. You can go find the closest one that matches that and, and probably provide them a reasonable starting point and then you can go iterate to fine tune it. Okay. We'll, we'll actually come back to that concept right at the end of the course. It's called product development and optimization. We'll see how to do it with latent variables. That's an extremely valuable technique to know. Okay. Uh, the other questions that were there, let's take a look. Oh, okay, so the next question asked for uh, calculating the T2 loading vector. So, Sean, oh, okay. Sorry, just, I was just thinking about that uh, product development, whatever. In doing that, you're assuming that the same correlation structure exists. Exactly. Yeah. So, like, I mean, if you're talking about a new product that's different than what you've seen in the data, does, like, so how good an assumption is that, or like? Yeah, you're asking a good question. Uh, so you're asking something that we will definitely address when we come back to but to answer your question, or have you think about it, how would you check that the correlation structure is actually the same? Um, you'd have to, I mean, you'd keep collecting more data, and I guess you could see, I don't know. <laughs> okay, it's, it's in the SPE. Okay. Yeah. It's, if, they're, if they're asking for a new product and the SPE is low, it's telling you they're asking for something that's consistent with your model. But we will we'll, we'll, we'll definitely get into those details towards the end. Charlene, T2 and P2, what is a pastry with high P2 value? Uh, high P2, um, high P2 would be really hard and 
These other, these first four are relatively small compared to Hyman. So we generally will focus on Hyman's much more than these others. By the end of today's class, you'll actually understand why we'll, we'll pay less attention to the small coefficients here. You'll, you'll be able to understand why we do that. So P2 mainly explains the hardness direction. But like you said, there is a bit of oiliness and density that has an effect. But it's mainly due to hardness. Hardness explains an additional 26% of the data. And the other key thing is that second component, P2, is orthogonal to P1, which means from a practical point of view, uh, you can adjust the process for hardness. If you know how hardness is adjusted, you can move that variable in your process independently without affecting the other pastry properties. Okay? Because those components are orthogonal to each other, you can deal with component one and whatever changes component one, whatever causes your pastries to be more oily and dense and crispy and fractured, you can adjust that. Maybe it's the heating time that you use in your, in your baking process. But the hardness is perhaps affected by some other characteristics of, of your process. You can adjust these two parameters independently without affecting the other parameters because the components are orthogonal. Okay, so from an interpretation using this model point of view, that, that's an important thing to, to realize. Okay, sure. Uh, so, just to explain again, we've got, let me just perhaps put up the um, loading, the loading plot here. So, here's our loading plot. We've got fracture and density that are heavily loaded in P1, and oiliness and crispiness that are heavily loaded in as positive P1. Hardness, for the most part, we can assume has no effect on the first component. So as we move from left to right in the P1, T1 direction, we're not changing hardness, okay, because the coefficient for hardness is approximately zero. So as we move across here, hardness barely, barely changes. The hardness of the pastry, as you track from left to right, doesn't move by much, okay? So let's say in my process, I can adjust the <coughs> density, fracture, crispiness, and oiliness by changing a particular variable. Maybe that variable is, let's say that variable is the percentage oil I add to my recipe. So the more oil I add to my recipe, I'm going to increase the crispiness of the pastry and at the same time decrease the density and the fracture angle of that pastry. I have to do that because I've shown that I don't have five independent variables in my data set. I only really have two independent variables, P1, and P2. So whatever I adjust to move left to right in the T1, P1 direction, let's say it is the amount of oil I add to my recipe, if I increase that, all these other variables will increase and these will decrease. Okay, They have to because I'm in, in this two-dimensional space. And whatever is driving that, in this case the percentage oil added to, to the recipe, moves you from left to right. Okay. Now let's say there's some second variable that I adjust to my process that affects how hard my pastry is. Maybe baking time. So the longer I bake my pastry, the harder it gets, the less I bake my pastry, the softer it stays. Okay. So I can adjust baking time and percentage oil added, generally independently of each other, and move in those two directions. So if someone says to me, I want pastries up here with high T1, T2 values. <coughs> Let's just show these two plots side by side. Okay, so there's my scores. And here's my loadings. Okay, I want a pastry that's, that's kind of up over here. What do I adjust in my process? In order to get pastries like these ones over here. I would increase the oiliness to get high T1, and I would increase my baking time to get high T2. Okay? And similarly, I can get into any other quadrant by doing uh, the necessary changes like that. Okay? So we really, what we're seeing here is that despite 
the fact that we measure five variables on our patients, we really don't actually have five independent characteristics. We really only have two characteristics, P1 and P2. Uh, and you might want to really call this direction the boiling direction, this direction the baking direction. You can, come, you can rename them to talk about it to your colleagues. You don't call it T1 and P1, that would be crazy. But you might want to just rename, rename what you call them. So we don't always have this case where you can interpret the loadings in this way, but in many cases it is possible. That's why I think it's a, it's a good starting one because it's something that you don't need to understand any chemical engineering about um, this process. You just have to have a basic understanding of cooking and baking, which most people do, and you can see that we're really in a two-dimensional space rather than a five-dimensional space. Okay. Is that clear to, to everyone? So those are the key uh, key characteristics uh, that I want you to get out of the assignment. The other, the last one was really just a calculation for T1. Did everyone was everyone able to replicate that value, 3.61? Straightforward. Uh, you take your raw data there. For each of the variables, you subtract the mean, divide through by the standard deviation, get your scale value for oil density and for the other five. Then you just substitute that back into T1. It's the equation. Um, so 0.25 is your new scale value for oil multiplied by 0.46. Minus 0.23 is your scale value for density multiplied by negative 0.47. So notice here, T1 here was a really high positive number. It was way over on the right hand side in the score plot. So notice here how positive times a positive, negative times a negative, positive, positive, negative, negative. And this value is, is somewhat slightly negative. So you're adding, 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 and you subtract a very small amount from hardness, which we know really doesn't affect that first component. So hardness has a very small contribution to the first direction to get this large T1. So if I had to ask you which of the five factors really has the most effect on T1, one thing you can do is to look back at these five factors and see which which of the five lead to the to this larger T1. Okay, so we're really seeing that oiliness and density rank much higher in terms of their contribution to T1. <coughs> so I mention that word contribution because the next class we'll look at contribution plots. That's exactly what a contribution plot is doing, it's saying we get this much contribution to T1 from oil, this much contribution to T1 from density, and so on. And we'll actually plot these five values as a bar plot. And it becomes very clear then which of your five measurements has the greatest contribution to this high T1 value. If I had, <coughs> just a second, um, if I had an outline over here, like a really, really high T1 value, I would do that same contribution calculation. See, is it oiliness or density or hardness or fracture angle? Which of the five variables, or maybe there's two out of the five variables, three out of the five variables, which of those are causing this outlier to be over here? Okay, so that's, we'll look at that in much more minute. Here's the raw value, 21.2 for its oiliness. Its oiliness is above the average. Yeah. So it's a, it, it's a patient with above average oiliness. This is a patient with below average below. density, above average crispiness, below average fracturability. 
So if I come back to my loadings plot, the, the easy way to interpret that is the value of high T1 has above average crispiness, above average oiliness, also has a below average density and below average fracture angle because, because it's on the opposite side. Okay, so that's where that terminology of above average and below average comes from. One of the columns in the data set has a contribution to the score. Because remember, this T1 here is a combination of the X's given by the pieces of the class. Oh, in this particular pastry, yes. You're saying that this is below average. So it's, it's the fact that it's then, like, so we're asking why is this point over here? Yes, here is the fact is the data set. The, the, we're, we're asking why is it such a high T1 value? It's because it has, in this particular case, it has above average oiliness and below average density. Okay. Not so much due to crispiness and fracture. Okay. Okay. So is that that derivation there for T1 should be fairly straightforward and by the looks of it, most of you probably have. Okay, any other questions on the assignment before we move on?